Well, hey guys, welcome back to Wasting Time in the Woods. I recently attended Overland Expo West where I bumped into Michael from Overland Bound. Now, Overland Bound is a member-based Overland organization with extensive forums, articles, as well as an app for off-grid navigation and connecting to the community. Michael has helped thousands of people get into overlanding for the first time, so I thought that he'd be the perfect person to bring here and ask every newbie overland question ever. Wow, that came out a lot more dramatic than in rehearsal. Maybe we should just roll the tape. All right, Michael, thank you. I really appreciate you doing this. I uh, couldn't think of anybody better to ask every newbie overlanding question ever. <laughs> thank you. Just so people have a little bit of background, you know, give pe people just a quick rundown of who you are, how long you've been at this, you know, yeah. and why they should trust you with their newbie overland questions. Yeah, so uh, I grew up like this, um, and I am um, the founder of an organization called Overland Bound. It's a worldwide uh, organization for adventure travelers. Um, we're, we're quite a quite a large community. Um, concentrated heavily here in North America, but also in, in Europe and, and Australia. And I've uh, made just about every mistake in the book, and I, I hope I can help you avoid some of them. Perfect. <laughs> and just for anybody uh, who hasn't heard, Overland Bound is the largest member-based overlanding organization in the world, essentially. Yep. Social platform, mapping, apps, check it out, overlandbound.com. But let's just Great. get right into it. You bet. Because I got some questions for you, man. Perfect. First. I just bought a four-wheel drive. What is the first thing that I should do to modify it and why? Light bar. What? That's a joke. <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, so build from the ground up, basically. That's, that's basically what we say. So start with your tires because they connect you to the ground. If it came with street tires and you're going to do any adventuring, then at least upgrade to all terrains. And I uh, recommend all terrains to 90% of the folks out there because we drive, drive long distances before going off the trail uh, or going, going on the trail. Um, and uh, all terrains are great for most applications. Uh, so what's people, a good all terrain? Can you give an example or yeah, two? Yeah, I really, I've used uh, BF Goodrich uh, KO2s forever. Um, and That's and I, I think it's just a rock solid tire. Currently on my rig, I have mud terrain tires. They're not as good on the road, that is for sure. But I equip the vehicle for the most extreme terrain I think I'm going to face. So what, what after that? After you do the tires, yep. what, what's next? Do you go right into the light bar or do you get that uh, six bike uh, hitch rack? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things in between the tires and the light bar. Um, if we go with that same philosophy of building from the ground up, get yourself a set of sliders. There's a difference between sliders and steps. You'll immediately find that if you have steps on your vehicle, the only thing they're meant to do is to catch you up on rocks, pivot you in directions you don't intend to go, and ultimately just get ripped off. So sliders- Now wait a minute. I gotta stop you there because <laughs> I've gotten several comments on my videos that the GX460 sidesteps uh, do an excellent job as you yeah, know, acting as sliders in a pinch. They'll support at least 80 pounds. Uh, we all, it's funny. I. I joke, I always ask this question when people are either selling sliders or when I'm talking to um, an automotive manufacturer, which we do, we, we actually do quite frequently, about the sliders that they provide on their vehicles. And I just ask, will this support the full weight of the vehicle? And if the answer is yes, then that is a legitimate slider that will protect you from falling on a rock. And let's talk a little bit about sliders just so folks know exactly what it is. So sliders are actually a part of your suspension. You will use them. And the way you use them in a, in a steep drop is that you roll your front tire. Well, hold on, let me stop you for a second because I think there's some people that probably don't have any idea what a slider is. It's a tubular bar generally yeah. yep. that is fully boxed in yep. and it goes where your side step would be but it's bolted to the frame rather right. than the body, right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and With the is... intention of protecting the body. Yes. And okay, it, sorry. It is just a smooth bar that goes from the front tire to the back tire and you can drop it on a rock and it will be it will be fine. Now, um, what about the ones that Toyota puts on there that have the little tubular steps that come out? Yeah, you're just going to tear those off, and, and they're okay. not rated. They're not rated to support the weight of your vehicle. Those are just going to come right off on the. So trail. those aren't sliders. Those are just steps playing the part of sliders in today's episode. Y yes, exactly. So I will actually share. Um, uh, I will troll my good friend um, Dan Rich, and he has worked for 
Toyota powertrain research and development for over 30 years. Uh, he was on the team um, that, that built the 80 series Land Cruiser. And uh, I rolled with him through the Nevada desert a few weeks ago, and he had those steps. And uh, we removed about one a day. And at the end of the trip, he was like, great, now I can go get my sliders. So, so they, just, they, just, they just come off. Um, and you need something that supports the full weight of your vehicle. So going from the ground up, get yourself a good set of all terrains. Uh, unless you're going to be really mud bogging, then get yourself a, pair, a set of mud terrains. And then get sliders because if you drop your new rig on a rock, you're going to be thousands of dollars of damage. And believe me, you're going to do it on one of your first trips out. So get yourself a set of sliders. And sliders are actually cheaper than a lift, right? I mean, a, a lift on average is at least a thousand bucks, probably yeah. more like two thousand. Yeah, you know, to three thousand. Yeah, and a lift, by the way, is 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 not gonna. You still need sliders because you're not gonna lift yourself out of the obstacles you're gonna find yourself on out in the trail. You need to be able to rely on your sliders to roll your front tire off a rock, come down on your slider, and then slide down the rock until your back tire hits it, and then go over the obstacle. Um, so well, you can't that sort of scenario. How the hell are you going to get back to the trailhead? <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's just one way. No, we'll talk about a... winches in a second. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. Now I do want to. I do want to say, depending on the the tire the tire size uh, question, you may want to get a lift before you get tires. Clearly, so you have to make that assessment. If you want to put larger tires on your vehicle, if you want to go 35s or above and you need to lift your vehicle in order to uh, accommodate those tires, then you would get your lift first. But tire okay. sliders lift. In some, in some combination, those are among the, the first vehicle upgrades you, you, you want to get. And then, like I said, ground up. So then from there, you would go underbody armor, you know, front bumper armor, rear bumper armor, and then go up from there. All right, well, that kind of leads me to my next question, which is where to sleep, you know, yeah. where to spend your money on, on shelter. Rooftop tent? Uh, ground tent or sleep in the truck? Which, when, and why? So I don't have a rooftop tent and I don't prefer them. One, they're not as easy to close or open as you might think. Conceptually, it's a great idea. It's like, yeah, I just park, flip open my tent, and I'm, I'm done, I'm good. I like to be able to leave quickly. Sometimes you need to be able to leave quickly. And closing them is a bit of work. Also, I like to keep my weight, my center of gravity low. So that's a lot of weight to have up high. And for that reason, nine times out of 10, I sleep inside my vehicle. I have a sleeping platform in the vehicle. But for the times when I don't sleep inside my vehicle, if we bring our kids and we have more people, then I have a tent like this one behind me. It's a gazelle tent. It's very fast to deploy, to put up and take down. Easier than a rooftop tent. Here's an exception. James Baroud, some of the other wedge tents are very easy to open and close. And those, I'm kind of a fan of. I like those. One other consideration. If you're in Northern Australia, get a rooftop tent because everything on the ground wants to kill you. So, <laughs> so get a rooftop tent. So it does depend where you're gonna be traveling as well. I gotta be honest, I hear a lot of people complaining about them between the wind noise and the truck shifting underneath you. Yeah. You know, if you I, move around a lot at night. Well, and I have to mention my wife, Corey, she has rheumatoid arthritis and, um, you know, we don't do anything but get older. Um, so, you know, navigating a, a, a ladder is not an option uh, for her and for, for many folks. Um, it's, it's not a comfortable option. You need to get up in the middle of the night to do your business. It's a pain. What I would say, if you really want to get a rooftop tent, please do. I would recommend traveling with somebody that has one. Go ahead and open it, you know, deploy it and close it um, so that you know really exactly what's involved and then make your decision. Awesome. Them. All right. I just got into overlanding. Can I just start building this monster out of my, you know, my truck into a monster or should I take it out stock a few times? How long should I wait before I put 39s on it and cut the fender wells out? I, um, I've seen both paths successfully done. I've built my truck over a decade. I bought it in 2010 and I slowly upgraded depending on my needs and my pocketbook. The trails and my trips informed what I needed. 
And, and I'm really happy right now with, with where I've arrived with my build. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really appropriate for me and the types of trips that I do. I have a good friend. I'll promote his YouTube channel, Social Pants, here on YouTube. And he bought it done. He tried different vehicles through the Overland Bound community. So he was talking to experienced people about what he wanted to do. And then he tried a couple of things and then he built his truck in the course of a year. But what he did right was research. If you are gonna do it quickly, do your research, get involved with a community like Overland Bound where you can go and kick tires at events and go, oh, I like that, I don't want that, right? And if you do your research, then it is possible to go ahead and just do it, buy your gear if you can get it, you know, uh, cause everything's out of stock. But you know, if you can get your gear, you can That's do true. it very quickly. Just do your research. Yeah, I've had a lift kit on back order for about three months now, don't <laughs> right. remind me. But um, that brings up another question. Are there efficiencies to be picked up by sitting down, building the plan out and just doing the build all at once? There, there are. Um, I'll mention a couple. Suspension is one of the big categories. So I've slowly built up my suspension um, over, over years and it's still not where I want it, want it to be. Um, most of that is by necessity. I don't have the money to go out and buy a, a King suspension and just put it on my truck. So, you know, I started with a two and a half inch old man emu lift. I started with heavy springs. That wasn't enough. So I went to heavy, heavy springs, but then my shocks weren't strong enough. So then I upgraded my shocks so that I didn't have the recoil. And it's really been an iterative process that is that has cost more money than if I just would have done it once. You can bring it someplace and say, um, hey, I'm gonna bring you the truck fully loaded. This is my expedition weight. Build a set of springs for me that that really? gives me the design, that gives me the performance characteristics I want hmm. for my truck under expedition weight. And, and you can have a set of springs made. And it's not as expensive as you might think. You can get it done for 700 to thousand dollars, depending on who you go to. And then you have a perfectly matched spring rate to your build. So if you do do it all at once, you can you can do things like that. Break it down for me real quick. You know, talking about suspension, talking yeah. about, you know, trail time. How much time do you actually spend driving on the trail where you actually use all that money you dumped into your truck yeah. versus how much time you spend on the pavement? Right. So we spend a lot of time on pavement, like 90% of the time is on pavement because we're, ta we're doing long duration trips. There are exceptions. You can do the Continental Divide Trail. Um, there, there are uh, some long distance off-road trails that you can plan, but most of the time you're doing a lot of driving on pavement. You know, one of the reasons you see these, these rigs that are completely built out is that, you know, when you need the capability, it's serious and you really do need the capability. So these builds that you see that look extreme aren't really extreme if you consider that people who do adventure traveling are building their rigs for the unexpected. So I'll have to, I, I just, cause we're just right on topic. I have to say a saying that is reoccurring is that, you know, if, if everything happened to according to plan, it wouldn't be an adventure. Uh, that's, a, that's absolutely true. And so you're building your rig for the unexpected and that allows you to go and adventure and adventure more. So you might not use it a lot, but when you need it, you need it. How much time do you actually spend camping versus running on the trail? You know, talking about yeah. some of those, you know, people are driving, trying to drive from Mexico to Canada or from the Arctic to the Antarctic for yeah. that matter. Us personally, we spend a lot of time driving. We typically move almost every day. So we did a trip from uh, San Francisco to the tip of Baja down to Cabo San Lucas. Uh, we took 17 days to do it. And we had uh, two locations where we stopped for two nights. Um, what I would recommend for folks on a longer duration trip is that you absolutely plan multiple day stops. So go someplace and stay there for three days. From a stamina standpoint, it really helps you on a, a, on a longer duration trip. 
if you're going really long term, if you talk to, you know, we have members that are full time overlanders that, that travel around the world full time. If you talk to them, they don't want to move because moving is expensive. Uh, petrol, fuel, it's expensive. It's the most expensive part of, of a journey. And so, you know, the slower you roll, the longer you can go for, for less money. What is the first piece of recovery gear that you should buy and why? A shovel. Um, uh, because you can get out of most uh, situations. I got a with, shovel. We call it the pooping shovel. Yeah, it does that too. See, it's multi-purpose. <laughs> it's the Swiss Army tool. It does everything. So with a shovel and a bottle jack, you can get out of most recovery situations. If you've got a long haul up a cliff, you're going to need a winch. But um, for most moderate, you know, I'm stuck situations, you can get out with a with a shovel and a bottle jack. You you lift you lift the rig. You throw you throw rocks under the tires. You lift it more. You throw rocks under the tires, and it may take a while, but you can lift your vehicle up and out of a situation over over the course of a, of a few hours uh, if you need to. So those are the first pieces of recovery gear to get. And not a uh, high lift jack. Everybody's got a high lift jack. Yeah, that's the last piece of recovery gear to take off your truck. But it looks so sexy. It looks like a weapon. <laughs> Again, if you want your Overland card, you have to get a high lift jack. Every expedition vehicle should probably have a high lift jack. That's debatable. It's not a given. But they're dangerous, right? It, they're really it, hard to use. They're dangerous. They, they, you really have to learn how to use a high lift jack properly. They will bend. They will, in extreme situations, they will shatter. Um, it's really easy for them to tip off the high lift jack or for the high lift jack to, to crush into the side of your vehicle. So they're, they're a very versatile tool. They can even be used as a come along or a winch. So they're very versatile. I would put it on your truck. I just think it's one of the last pieces of gear to use. Um, after a shovel and, uh, and a bottle jack, I would go with a set of max tracks. Then I would go with a winch. Max tracks isn't something that there is just a million knockoffs for. You know, what can you cut corners on? And what should you really, you know, buy once, cry once, as they say, you know, double down and yeah. just pay for something good? Well, I'll just I'll answer the question about max tracks. You get what you pay for, period. And ultimately, when I say buy once, cry once, I'm telling people to save themselves money. Because well, you're going to explain get, that. Yeah. I think because most people are going to look at a set of Max Tracks and go, "It's a it's a piece of plastic. There's about twenty seven cents in materials in there, yeah. and that's about all there's to it." Yeah. What's the difference between a sixty dollars set of recovery boards you can get on Amazon and the what three four hundred dollars set of Max Tracks that you get? It's really easy and inexpensive to make something that looks like Max Max Tracks. Um, what you're paying for with, with Max Tracks is their R&D. It's similar to ARB bumpers. ARB bumpers are crash tested. They work with your airbags. They, they have engineering specs that you can review to see how they perform in a crash test. All of that, and, and Max Tracks is similar, all of that R&D costs a lot of money that the company needs to recoup. With traction boards specifically, if the compound is too hard, it will rip apart your tire. If the compound is too soft, you'll ruin the board right away. It will it will melt. So they found just the right compound that 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 is the balance between both of those extremes. And I've used a lot of you know the knockoff recovery boards, and they just haven't done the job. Uh, and I and and you know Max Trax just does a great job. What is your you know? I don't want to use my recovery gear. And, yeah. and I think that a big part of that is making sure that you're outfitted and you're built out, you know, the way you should be for wherever you're going. Yeah. So what is Michael's minimum spec? I know it's different for everybody, but what's your minimum spec for tires and wheels, suspension lift and a roof rack? Those are kind of like the big things that would allow anybody to yeah. really get out there. So, so for me, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good set of tires. I have to have rock rails and 35s. Um, and the 35s uh, for me, they, they mean um, two and a half inches of lift. So, so that's the min spec for the type of trip that I do. If I didn't have 35s, I wouldn't be able to go on the, on the trails that I want to go on. And of course, four wheel drive is a requirement. So those are my basic requirements. Now, what I use all the time 
are my lockers, my, my, my rear lockers mostly, but sometimes I get into a uh, front, front locker as, as well. Um, but that's my, my min spec. And I also, I use the armor. I'm, I'm, I'm banging my truck down the trail all the time. Um, I do use my, my winch and my recovery gear. So I, I use everything I have, but my min, min spec, you know, for the type of trip that, that I, I do frequently is uh, lift tires, uh, rock rails, sliders, um, uh, four wheel drive, um, 35. Well, let's talk about that real quick because there's a lot of people that don't have a four wheel drive. They can't afford a four wheel drive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can't even find a four wheel drive right now because everybody already bought them. Yeah, essentially, and they're yeah. twice as much as they were last week. Yeah, can you overland in a two-wheel drive? Should you overland in a two-wheel drive? What are the limitations that you should keep in mind? Yeah, you you sure can. Um, and again, it goes back to safety. Um, but please get out there and enjoy. Go to the beach. Go to you know Forest Service road trails that are well maintained. Um, go to safe environments. But you absolutely can go out there, put up a tent. You can even do long duration trips in a two-wheel drive. You just have to plan. Uh, you just have to plan accordingly. Um, I, you know, if I were to <clears throat> try and save you a little money, if you get into off grid, you're gonna migrate to four wheel drive right away. And I see it all the time. Somebody will enter the community with a, a two wheel drive, and they'll get engaged with the community, and and um, immediately they're upgrading to a four wheel drive. So if you think it's something you're gonna do frequently. Um, you probably just want to start with a, a four-wheel drive. And it's like the one thing that you can't upgrade, right? It's a replacement, not it, an upgrade. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it, you it, can never add four-wheel drive. Yeah, to for all intents and drive. purposes, it really is a, a replacement, yeah. Where should people get started? I think a lot of people, you know, they run down to the Toyota dealership or the Ford dealership, they buy a four-wheel drive, and then they're like, what's next? Where do I yeah. take this thing? Yeah, you go immediately to the App Store and you download Overland Bound 1, available on iOS and Android. The U.S. Forest Service roads are an awesome resource. Um, it, we're, we're lucky in North America that we have public access to that information. Um, you can go online and you can see uh, what trails you can go on and what vehicles they're, they're made for. Yeah, we're really spoiled here in North America with just the, the vast variety and accessibility that we have to nature. Absolutely, I'll tell you what, um, you know, a lot of folks here have exotic ideas about traveling through Africa, Australia, and other places. And I've done that, I've, been, I've gone to Australia a, a few times, um, and it is wonderful in its own right, but a lot of folks who travel the world say there is no better overlanding than what we have here in North America. It's We are very fortunate to have all the different uh, uh, terrain, um, access to public lands. We're very fortunate here. Awesome. Well, with that in mind, I think that we should wrap this up so people can get out there and get started. Right on. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate it. I think this was awesome information for anybody that's getting into overlanding. Um, I hope that uh, I can talk you into coming back on the channel sometime and give us some more information. But thanks, man. This is awesome. You bet. Hey, no, thank you for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Well, we will talk to you soon. And for anybody who doesn't know, overlandbound.com is where they can find you and where they can find the community and resources you talked about, right? Absolutely. All thank right. you, guys. All right. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.